Hi, I'm Evelyn. Uh, this talk is called Integrating with Third Party APIs, Big and Small, uh, parentheses and Elixir, uh, slash Phoenix. And so this talk is mostly going to center around some like larger architectural decisions that you can make that I think help working with third party APIs and all the sort of like joys and pains that come along with that. Um, and so like our main test case will be an app that I've been working on um, in, in Phoenix that does some of this stuff and we'll sort of go from there. So um, yeah, we'll start with this app that I've been working on. It's called, it's called Funnel, it's the working title. Um, so Funnel is like a GitHub uh, app that whenever you open a pull request will get the webhook, makes an AP, extra API call to the GitHub API, and then sends the status um, to the pull request that you, you just opened up or changed. Um, so in, some way, in many ways, it functions like what, how we're used to like CI functioning, where um, you push the commit, you open a pull request, some, you do some event on GitHub, and then you get a response back saying like thumbs up or thumbs down. So Funnel will check your sort of Git branch that you have to uh, merge uh, the pull request and see if it meets the criteria that are set up by your team. So some of those criteria could be like, is it squashed? Is it rebased? Is it both? Um, and stuff like that. So, it's, so at a high level, it's basically trying to like maintain and help like focus the team's uh, Git practices when it comes to merging feature branches into like a developer or, or master branch. Um, so at a high level, that's kind of what Funnel does. Um, and so this is, this is the GitHub API, the or GitHub app that I'll be kind of like talking about as we go through this. And um, yeah, it's, we'll be talking about the GitHub API uh, because of that. Um, so I'm going to figure out how to do this thing. OK, cool. And yeah, so I think really though the whole idea is to like, and this is probably not like controversial in, in, for the most part. It's like abstracting yourself from the API that you're working with. Like we don't. I, I as like someone who's working on like a, a, an app that talks to the API, I don't want to be, don't want to experience like overly large amounts of like churn if the API changes or if it's upgraded and, and I want to move to like the next version. I want to have like a nice level of, of abstraction so that the particulars of the API are somewhat decoupled from the, like the business logic and concerns of like my application itself. So. It's a little bit like that. It's just like really getting abstract and like blowing things apart, a la Carl Sagan. Some really good glasses. <laughs> I can't tell if he's like, if it's like, if he's like, yeah, I think he's thinking really amazing or if he just like ate a marshmallow. <laughs> I don't know, he seems a little sad or it's overwhelmed. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, like happy crying. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is so amazing. Anyways, um, <laughs> so yeah, it was really, about like again, like about sort of creating these layers of abstraction. So like, let's talk a little bit more about like what some of those layers could be. Um, so this is sort of like the layers that are, are in this particular application, and so it, it starts with from the top where you have like your controller actions that are handling these like incoming requests from or incoming webhooks from the GitHub API. Um, those th th that will like call something again in like a service module, something uh, like in a context as we talked about before. Um, the service module will call these like helper functions, which talk, which use like the client module, which actually calls the the REST API that we're interfacing with um, for GitHub. And so this like we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about like what are all these different layers and like how do they work together and set up some of the benefits of like when it comes to testing and like error handling and also just like like semantic programming per se um, for that. So we'll start from the bottom and go up. I think it gets like. The interesting part is how they were in the middle. Um, the REST API, like obviously, just like what are the different endpoints, like uh, github.com slash API slash, uh, or api.github.com slash um, repositories or users. There's, there's some resource that you're trying to get to. Um, so, the, so that's, in, in our case, for funnel, uh, that wraps in a client module. Um, that client module is called uh, Tentacat, uh, which is an Elixir module, uh, or an Elixir library. That basically sort of does this. Let me put it bigger. Does all, all this like because like it's, to some level it's like basically string interpolation. We have like we have a function that we pass in a number of parameters, and what comes out is like it, it calls some. Like here's so this is like a kind of a minimum. Minimum example is like you make a client, you 
and then you say like users find name, and then you pass the client in. So that's this line right here. Um, and so yeah, so what this library is going to be doing is like again string interpolation, like uh, taking arguments and putting them into like the URL, whether it's the params or the the route or whatever. Um, so so that, that's kind of what, how, what, serve, what the client module serves here. Um, the helpers module is, is sort of used to take those individual client calls that are wrapped by the client module and like turn them into like more semantic pieces, things that are like maybe commonly useful, but also like able to be able to, or commonly useful, um, but also like help you think of like a higher level of abstraction from like, so instead of like saying like I need to get all the repositories and then check all their commits, you can just say like get all the, get all the commits of all the repositories and have those like two or three commands kind of be like taken care of and encapsulated in a single function inside the helpers module. And then of course there's, a, there's like a service module which is a step above that which like gives you a single point of entry for something like a controller to call into like the service and then which then kind of spiders out into the rest of this uh, the rest of these layers and then returns like some sort of status um, response or like does some other actions or work alongside. Um, so those, that's kind of like the high level of how this works um, or like what some of these different levels are. And so next I want to like show like a couple examples of these. We already looked at the REST API, of course, and the client module. So some of the helpers module stuff I think will be interesting, and then also the service itself. Um, okay. So of course there's like we have our there's a controller here. So of course like when we uh, or sorry I need to get the events controller. Um, in the events controller, we basically have this receive function, the receive action that like takes in, uh, you know, some GitHub hook, and then calls this method called get sent, which is basically like I think I heard Will talking about this earlier, like a basically uh, like a param struct. So it basically takes the payload that you get from the request and like turns it into a uh, an elixir struct. So you can pass that around and do type checking and like know that you have all the pieces outside of that struct or outside of that payload that you would need for the application. Um, and again, like a way of like decoupling the logic of the application, like some of the like inners from the like exact structure of the API and like the like structure of the body responses that come back from it. Um, so in there we call this, we, we sort of construct this uh, options object and then we dip into a service call. Um, this like handle send thing, which which using as a pattern matching, um, we'll call like this investigator module, which is more like at the service level. And so the, the investigator, uh, see it, the first thing it does, it, it creates a client for the API using the, the client library. Um, it does some work, ends up, send, ends up sending statuses and, and calling like other parts of the service. Um, the helpers bit, Basically, like are like again like smaller chunks. Um, for example, like get open pull requests it basically ends up wrapping a you. So you get all the open pull requests for a particular like repository, and like this repository in this case is like a database record that we keep track of as like sort of like parallel bookkeeping to what happens on GitHub. Um, so the first thing we do is we like make our own client, and then we do some sort of. Uh, API call like doing a, with a couple like options kind of like hard coded in there for this particular um, like use case of like getting all the open pull requests. Um, you'll see over here this like little bit of pattern matching. So this is the API uh, module returns a tuple of the return code, uh, the payload, um, or the payload body, and then like the full HTTP response. Um, so basically, what we do here is we say uh, we use pattern match on two hundred. And so if any sort of error comes back from the API module, uh, from, the, from the API client, then we, sort of be, we get a pattern match error, and then we sort of see what the body of the response was. So it's like an easy way to sort of like quickly head off um, sort of like API errors, whether it's like something that's wrong with off, or like a resource you're looking for isn't there anymore, or something along those lines. Instead of like having this returned by the function and then get called somewhere else, like you find out right away as soon as that call doesn't come back as a 200 that you, you see sort of like what went wrong there. Um, cool. Okay. So yeah, those are kind of like all the different, all the different pieces and like levels of abstraction. Again, moving from um, like the bare sort of like REST API to like some string interpolation to like actionable chunks to like actual like 
domain logic up to the controller for like actually talking to um, or responding to the, the GitHub API or like a webhook or something like that. Um, the one thing I want to go back into for a little bit is the uh, in funnel it's called a set as it's sort of like the thing that you sort of like investigate or track um, when a, a, an event comes in. Um, so like, again, like so some of the benefits of like having this uh, like payload uh, struct is that it again, takes a lot of these parameters and like things out of the body of like a, of a request or of the response um, and packages it up and the application to to consume. So like all the all the different um, services and all of the services and like methods and helpers all use this particular struct. The only thing that touches the actual uh, like body payload is the controller itself and turns it into like this options object. That kind of works well for this application because it's basically um, a controller with like one or two services. Like it's not like a terribly like complex uh, set of like contexts and domains. Um, but some, so like one of the benefits of that though is that we can take a, a number of requests and translate them because so like with GitHub you can get like a, a, a webhook for a pull request being open, a pull request being changed, a push event happening. There's a number of different like actions you can take that will sort of like trigger this this hook. Um, and they have like slightly different um, structures to the body of those requests. So there's a single there's sort of like a single entry point to this particular struct. Um, this get set method, which takes in like a, a body, uh, yeah, the, the request body, and then says like, okay, like depending on what kind of request this is, I'll sort of like figure out the structure to use, um, or depending on what kind, of, what, what type of request this is, I'll call the, the appropriate method to traverse like all the different structure of this body and grab out things and put them into like a uniform uh, object that the rest of the application can consume. So I think this is like kind of like. Besides, like from the like business logic sort of standpoint, like the main sort of line of defense of like keeping the application insulated from all the different like intricacies of the payloads and like the requests that you get in from from GitHub. And so, if if at some point in the future we wanted to subscribe to a different kind of event, but like um, let's say like adding a comment to a request to a pull request or something along those lines, that would just involve like adding some another type to this case switch uh, switch case and then. Having like another sort of get sent from pull request method that would like traverse that particular kind of uh, payload and then like put it into this particular struct. Yes. Question. I think it was line sixteen above. Yeah. Uh, there's a mock attribute on line six. Enforce keys. I'm not familiar with that. What is that attribute? Um. So that is a uh, basically like a like simple validation for like you can't construct one of these structs without having all of those keys present. So you, the, what are these, these keys can be nil, like I could have the action be nil and like a particular version of this uh, code had that, but um, you can't construct basically a set struct without having all of those keys in the object. So the enforce keys uh, on that big data only applies right before our key find struct 2016 type declaration? Um, oh, for the dev struct? Yes. It wouldn't make sense for anything else, right? I don't think so. I haven't seen it in other use cases. Did you? So is that a reserved module attribute? Or yes. Do you use that somewhere else? Okay. Yeah, that's um, that's like yeah, part of the spec. It's not something custom in this particular case. So just to clarify, so yeah, yeah. the requests actually coming into the controllers are also from GitHub, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and so you're using this to take the payload that's posted to your site from GitHub mm -hmm. to and to like convert it to like. The, the funnel version or the funnel thing you work with. And then are you also at some point converting it back to a payload or is that just like somewhere or you're just doing that manually somewhere when you're making the, the root calls to the API? Totally. Um, yeah, so basically this grabs all the, all the information we would, in some cases this, way this, this grabs all the information you could ever need from a particular body. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, totally. That's like that's part of that. And then in order to like send that status back to GitHub for a particular, um, I guess like commit is, is sort of how statuses are keyed. Um, we just use like the branch name, the repo. So like it, the, the API for like sending a status is just um, I think the, the the parameters or the, the URL is like user repo name and then like commit hash. So you grab a couple a couple keys out of the struct and then pass them into 
a subsequent API call you made back to GitHub. And is that usually like the helper layer essentially, or, um, or would that be the service layer? Yeah, so that happens at, like in the helper layer basically. So like all the different, there's basically like a set of uh, functions that will like have those like preset statuses that you would send for a particular commit. Right. So in the, if the so between the between the, the the once you're past the part of the beginning of the the controller all the way down to the helper, you're like pure funnel. Domain. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah, and like it gets a little bit more murky when we get back into like the database sort of layer because we need to do a little bit of bookkeeping off, off of like GitHub database IDs for like which repo is which because we we store a couple settings like what is your preference for this repo in terms of like Git practices. Um, and so we keep it off of like the GitHub ID that comes in the request. So it gets a little bit muddier at the bottom, but like, um, but like all all the in between layers just like basically just did this logic. Yeah, same as <laughs> um, Any other questions about this so far? I should have prefaced by saying you can like stop me at any point and just like interject because it's a pretty small group. Cool. Um, so I, I actually want to say, yeah, we'll keep talking about like the payload structure a little bit more. Because the other thing besides just like making like the, I guess one of the side effects of making all your business logic and like domain logic inside of the application keyed off of that is that it also makes it much easier to test. Um, you don't have to uh, have like a set of factories or like fixtures that actually generate like a pull request. You can just have a fixture that generates like one of these structs and then you can pass that into any basically any part of the application and have it like behave appropriately and like kind of test that kind of stuff. Um, some other things that I think are interesting, like moving into like more of the testing stuff, is um, like kind of like the different kinds of mocking you can do for, for this kind of like for this kind of uh, API integration stuff. Um, so like for a while we were using this library called XVCR, which is like probably sounds really close to like a, a Ruby library called VCR, um, which is super useful for uh, sort of like Type coupling your tests and your code like very tightly with the API that you're working with because it basically like records a series of requests and responses and then feeds them back or plays them back for you whenever you run the test. So you don't have to. So if GitHub goes down for like an hour, I can still run my tests off of like the last thing that I recorded from that. Um, so that's really nice because it's like pretty easy to set up. You don't have to like do a lot of stubbing and mocking and stuff like that. Like uh, basically in the test itself. Uh, yeah, so it's still use the tape thing. You basically just like name a tape and then let me find a good example of this right here. Tape as a cassette thing? Yeah. Continue with like the VCR metaphor. Like the theory of the so basically, like if you don't have the, the ask for cassette, it'll like make the actual requests um, to the, the internet or, in our case, the GitHub API, and then it will record whatever happens. And the next time you run it, it'll just pick up whatever was recorded last time. Um, let's see. So like this one, you can see here. This uh, I'm not seeing this at all, but. Basically, all you do is so it's called XVCR, and you just use this, this macro called use cassette, and you give it a name, and then set it up to block anything that happens. It'll like record or playback for you. And if if you try to make a request that hasn't been recorded, like if you have a tape, like a set of recordings, and you try to make a request that isn't in the in the tape, it'll like tell you that and, and so throw an error, and you'll have to do do re-record re and do setup. So that was like really useful for getting things like started off in the beginning with this project because. Again, it doesn't require like a lot of code setup. It mostly just requires like having like whatever sort of like like there's no AP, there's no uh, GitHub like development API environment. So uh, what I ended up doing was basically just like going in and making a repo for it to like query um, and like get information from, and just like didn't touch it for a while. Um, so that was kind of the first version of that was setting up the like setting up the external environment properly and letting it just sort of record those things. Um, and then later we were able to like spend more time. Um, actually sort of like stubbing things out more explicitly. So for that, we used uh, a library called, it's actually just called Mock. Um, and so Mock will basically let you like, it basically does like some sort of uh, like module like replacement uh, stuff. So like here what you can see it says like set up with Mocks. It's another macro that comes with that library. Um, 
we're, we're passing in this function that has like a big sort of like chunk of mocks that are used for all the tests in this folder um, and in this file. And so we're, we're mocking things like some off stuff. Um, we're mocking like what are some of the like service elements that are being called by other parts of this particular um, method or this particular module. And then uh, we sort of just like let it go and then you can go in and say like, it adds the, the ability to say like, was this particular function called with these particular parameters? Um, these are the wild cards. So it basically allows you to like assert that this particular API call was made with like for anything. And then you can also of course refute something and so like in this one we're saying like that this particular helper was called with this, the same set that we've like fed into this particular test and like we don't really care what like like the exact hash or like something like that was. It just sort of like checks to see if uh, like at a higher level that that function was called with this particular um, thing that we passed into this particular test. Um, so, so, so something that I think about this is again you have to be more explicit so you're more aware of like the different dependencies of like the different calls and like how the different pieces depend on each other. Um, but it takes more time to set up like like writing this is like it's not a lot of code, but it, like it's like a very particular like 50 line or 20 lines. Um, I know the structure is kind of basically you pass it like an array of modules and like what are the functions under each module you want to like replace or mock. Um, and one of the other one of the other downsides that because of the way this mocking works, you can't uh, like run your tests asynchronously. You have to like run them all sequ uh, sequentially uh, because of the, because it's just like replaces the module. So like if they're running at the same time, it'll like call the same. It'll, it'll, like the mocks will basically collide. Um, and uh, another thing that's like not great about it is uh, you can't mock the, the module you're testing either. Like like if I'm like trying if I want to mock one function inside of the module that's that's sorry if I'm testing one function in a module and I want to mock a different function that that function calls like a private one or something like that or like uh, something along those lines then like th this also doesn't work for that either. But the kind of I, Felt like that helped us like clarify like what some of the boundaries needed to be between some modules. So it seemed like a net seemed like a net okay. Um, and again, and then like the last part of this again, like coming back to the sent or like the, the options uh, struct is that like we have basically like a factory of like a small like zoo of like different structs that that you could get from from GitHub and these are reported from like requests that were actually made. And then you can, and then these can be passed to like basically any of the tests that for like that middle three quarters of the application stack, and then like have that all that kind of stuff uh, work. So again, like again, keeping yourself a little bit insulated from some of like intricacies of like the GitHub API, and then like letting yourself reuse these factors as much as possible um, for like constructing these structs uh, for each test. Yeah, this, this is a bunch of. Uh, test data, basically, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is, what would that, or is this all in its own file in so, directory? So this is uh, in like the fixtures directory of, of the test folder. Um, well, actually, it's in the support folder, but I'm oh, sorry. So it's basically like a, a, a library called Ex Machina um, that is a factory, and let me show you like how these get used exactly. Is it, it's, it's actually, it's, yeah, yeah sorry, good to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so basically any of these factories, any of these factory methods you define, it'll just, you can call a, like a factory.build inside of your tests, um, and then pass it a symbol that's basically the name of the function minus the underscore factor at the end, and it'll just call that and return whatever comes in from it. Um, so it's basically just a way of like kind of centralizing all the different like test data you have mocked that you use across your tests. So as far as I'm, I'm really glad you brought up testing because you know, specific to external APIs and mm -hmm. calling them from Phoenix and so on, mm -hmm. um, I totally get why you would want BCR. Yeah. Um, and Mox is like not just for, it's because your users has, have dependencies in them, right? You don't exactly. It has nothing to do with API specifically, it's because the way you abstracted everything. And that's true. Okay. But one of the things that's nice about having like this, um, I guess the way the way that it kind of intersects back with this is that if you if you mock the client module in those tests, you can basically avoid having to use BCR. Because if you if you, if you mock like this layer and say like well anytime I call like Tentacat and we can have API like repositories this thing, give me back this like skeleton data structure. Um, and you can even sort of like 
fully selectively fill out the, the, the structure. So you don't, you don't have to populate like the entire body, just like the part that you actually need to keep the test going, which is kind of also interesting to sort of like see like which parts you right. actually depend on. Um, so anyways, that's, that's, sorry, I'm mixing up a couple of things here. So that's how you would have this one, like sort of like mocking out like what are the things that should return. Um, but anything above this, you can basically just mock what Tempe cat returns and just say like, like here's like an object, like here's like a name or like an ID. So do you, in the service module, do you mock the helpers module at all, or do you like yes. actually, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, basically like any, at any point you're mocking everything, you mock the layer below, which then of course cuts off the, off the lower layers. Yeah, yeah. Like, how do we check that it's squashed? Uh, totally. Uh, so, so here's so basically, yeah. So here's this, this is the strategy module with the squash submodule, and so each each strategy has um, basically sort of like doing like a, a really quick and dirty version of like an interface or like a behavior. We just sort of like have an isometric, uh, isomorphic uh, API for each of the different strategies. So every, every strategy has an investigate push method that takes a sense in like a client. And so for the, for the squash one, we, the first thing we do is we mark the uh, incoming sent or like payload is like a pending status, which is like the little yellow circle that means we're still looking into it, we don't know yet. Um, so then we get an open uh, branch commits list. So you see, we're make, this is like one place where we're breaking the pattern a little bit. We make it a, a call directly to the Tendicat pulls, um, like pull requests, and then like the commits in that pull request, and get a list of them. We're still using doing the error handling, where we check for 200 immediately in the uh, in the return to pull the pattern up on that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. So basically, we're just like, yeah. So the squash one is actually one of the easier ones. The rebase one is a little bit more. Yeah, well, the, Involved because you basically have to like traverse the entire, uh, the entire like uh, commit list to like see like at any point do you have the same SHA as like the parent of the head SHA. Um, anyways, so yeah, this one is like a little bit more involved. Like, the squash one is like a, you can just like do like kind of a, a uh, quick list count. Um, and like the nice thing, one of the nice things about this is that, or like one of the unique things I guess is that you don't actually clone the repo; you just make GitHub calls. To inspect like the state of the code, and so you get a couple things for free. Like when I said, when we get like a, a pull request, uh, like a list of commits, like GitHub is already doing a bunch of dipping for us that we have to do otherwise for like finding where the, the branches um, diverge. Um, sorry, did, you, did that answer your question about like yeah. the different layers and like some of the mocking stuff? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, well, I think that was kind of actually the last thing I wanted to talk about was just like kind of some different testing strategies around different layers and like the uh, the payload options. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening and happy to talk about this stuff more uh, afterwards. Thanks. Any more questions? Any more questions? Or just general ones? So when you're setting up the box, uh, do you do you always mock out any external like module dependencies, or do you sometimes want to go through and sometimes don't if like it's kind of like a stateless module or whatever? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I think the general rule that that we're that been converging out of the code base is like really just mocking all the all the like lower level modules or all, all the depend all the dependency modules. Um, because otherwise we end up we basically end up going all the way through and hitting an API call, right? Sure. And then having to like do some reporting around that, which tends to be a little bit more fragile and like, especially when you're trying to like set up branches in a particular way to like inspect their histories to make sure they match up. Like, it, to me, it feels like really easy to like mess up my test environment. <laughs> like I have like a private repo on GitHub that just like sits there and like don't touch these four branches, <laughs> or all the tests will not be, or, or it'll be a pain to like to like redo all the tests or some number of them. And actually, in that whole thing with PCR as well, um, I don't know, it's been a while, but I do remember at one point in time where it was like you were having to report the sets because it seems like it was just being taken a long time. And, 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 and
in a different order. And if you make it the payload and it's not in the same structure, you expect it, then mm -hmm. you change it, then which comes up with different kinds of numbers and costs. Um, so totally. Yeah. You see our deposit fish, right? <laughs> <laughs> Depending. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. Did a real three quarter percent. Yeah. I just, I just, it was for, for the only thing that like uh, I, I find that like if, when your tests are so noisy and you get all the time, then you start ignoring them, and um, that 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 keeps on keeps on the loop over and over. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if it's if it's great all the time, then it's fine. You get noise right, and someone actually says something. So if you've got like a set of tests that are always red, then that then people don't see when they're actually failing that now for different reasons. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like that is that's another good point about like some of the downfalls of like VCR can be like if your recordings are stale then like yeah yeah, yeah you'll you'll get have interesting errors in production, which I guess is like not something that's headed off by like mocking <coughs> client modules because same, yeah. same problem. There's like I feel like one place like VCR is like classic use cases like I have like. My like incoming request is like a standard. It's not coming from like a GitHub webhook. It's like a standard client, and like I want to write a like a pretty big old extra, extra like integration test that like maybe. But somewhere in there, my backend makes a call to an H, you know, like an external API. Maybe it's the easiest way to do that is to like actually just run it once, VCR it, and then like you know keep doing it that way. Totally. Even then, yes, problems. What's uh, what's Ambit? Oh, <laughs> um, Ambit is like a word that means like bounds. So like out of Ambit is, is like a way of saying out of bounds. Um, it was from this like uh, science fiction or like fantasy novel I read as a kid, where like if you try to message a wizard that's like not in your current dimension, it says like oh out of Ambit. <laughs> it was it is out of Ambit. Cool. <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, so that's what it ended. <laughs> Apparently, it's a legal term too, but I didn't know that until like six months ago. Oh, whoa. Really? Nice. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you.